Hi, I'm Gail Rubin. Welcome to A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. Hi, I'm Gail Rubin, host and author of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. Welcome to today's show, brought to you by the fine folks at French Funerals and Cremations. As the doyen of death, check out the pearls, I'm all about getting the funeral planning conversation started. A doyen is a woman who's considered senior in a group who knows a lot about a particular subject, and that would be me when it comes to the party no one wants to plan, a funeral or a memorial service. By thinking about what you'd want in your funeral and having that conversation before there's a death in the family, you can reduce stress at a time of grief, minimize family conflict, save money, and create a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. That's what this program is all about. Just as talking about sex won't make you pregnant, talking about funerals won't make you dead, and your family will benefit from the conversation. So let's get that conversation started. Our guests today to discuss life celebration and the celebrant movement are Paul Layer, Vice President of French Funerals and Cremations, and celebrant Samara Rivet will be with us in the second half of the program. So Paul, welcome, glad to have you with us. Thank you, good to see you. So let's talk about life celebrations, the funeral as the party no one wants to plan. What does a family go through to plan? What are those elements of memorialization that really help? Well, when we talk about it with families at our company, we, we bring in four basic elements that we like to bring up. We talk about viewing the body and why that's important, um, not just as an identification uh, purpose, but also as the value of seeing the, the deceased uh, at the mortuary prior to ceremony or service or disposition. Now, can I just ask Absolutely. you about that? I mean, that's not everybody's tradition, though, no. to have a viewing. No. I know in the Jewish tradition, it's usually closed casket. But, you know, I think we get away from that idea of encountering the dead because we turn it over to the professionals. But even in the Jewish faith, we have the tahara, which they would do the dressing. Right. So some members of the Jewish community would still be involved in, in, encountering, in, in the encountering the body. And I do that. Neat. <laughs> yes. Neat. Very important process. But, you know, 30 years ago, uh, everyone saw the body. Mm -hmm. um, and, and today we're, we're seeing that only about 75% of folks are seeing the body. So there's been a real social change hmm. in the last 30 years. And some people need that visual um, reinforcement to actually get the message that, yes, this person is dead. I, I think so. I think God created us to, see, uh, to believe what we see. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that is an important element. And we, we have examples in society where folks are looking for people who have died 9-11. Uh, folks are still looking for those yeah. people missing from the Twin Towers yeah. after years and years of, of them being gone. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a real important element to accepting the reality of the loss that's taken place. Mm -hmm. And what's the next step? The next one would be ceremony or service mm -hmm. so that we have some way of not only recognizing and mourning the loss, but also celebrating the life that's been lived. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that would be the second element is, is some type of ceremony. Well, you know, I did a project called My 30 Funerals in 30 Days, right. and I've done it for three years. And one particular um, uh, celebration that stands out in my mind was held in a bowling alley bar. And it was held by this man's friends because his wife said, I don't want to have a funeral for him. Absolutely. And that really does cheat the community out of mourning the passing of a good friend. It's an interesting dichotomy these days because we've gotten so far down the road away from having some type of traditional service um, and we've shied away from the mourning part of it, but a lot of folks are still choosing to embrace the celebration part of it. Mm -hmm. And what we try and encourage is maybe a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's meant to help people express their emotions. That's correct. Which, when repressed, can cause 
real issues down the road. We think so. Yeah. And a lot of sociologists and psychologists tend to support that theory as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what do you Memorialization. Do? The, uh, the objective of placing the remains, whether in a body form or in a ashes form, in, in a place of permanent rest so that uh, there is a place of identification and history and memorialization and remembrance. Mm -hmm. Too many ashes wind up in people's closets. They do. <laughs> they do. Um, and in fact, I know in the Catholic Church and uh, in Judaism, it's important to give ashes a final resting place. Certainly the reform movement mm -hmm. allows for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we're seeing that cremated remains these days. You might be surprised, Gail, to, to know this, but right here in Bernalillo County, only 12% of cremated remains are making their way to a cemetery, which means that 88% wow. are going somewhere else, whether it's home or the family is disposing of them Scattering. themselves. Mm -hmm. Scattering. Yeah. And then the fourth Part? would be some type of reception. Now, a lot of times the, cele the celebrant or the, the clergy would have that as part of the ceremony, especially if it's a life celebration ceremony. Mm -hmm. But if it's a more traditional type service, then we can often have some type of gathering after the funeral or the memorial service. You know, and I think this is one part that people don't think about is that you've got all these people you need to invite Mm -hmm. to come to this event, and if you don't have all of your contacts for family and friends in one place written down, that can make it very difficult to alert people, especially on short notice, hey, we're having, you know, come to the funeral or the party or the celebration. That's yeah. right. It, yeah. it can, and so notification is an important element of that. But in, in the uh, old days, we used to go back to the church to have some type of reception. Nowadays, we're providing that at the funeral home because mm -hmm. folks are being uh, less and less involved in, in churches these days. Right. And well, and that was my next question about clergy involvement. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does a funeral home work with clergy when it comes to preparing a funeral or memorial service? We still rely on them in a, in a very big way, and they're very, very important to what we do every day, and they help us in, in just in an extreme way. But what we found in the last 30 years is that less and less clergy are being called on by the family. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, we had clergy involved almost every time. These days, maybe only 50 to 60 percent of the time. Well, who's doing the service then? Well, sometimes family members step forward. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes celebrants step forward. We have staff that are trained to uh, conduct services as an organizer. I'm a certified celebrant. There you go. Yes. Yep. <laughs> and uh, although that's still not at the level that we'd like to see it at, uh, that is an option. And then we have retired clergy who step in that can conduct le uh, less of a religious ceremony, more of a secular ceremony as well. Well, and certainly you probably see families that also do not have a service we or do. a party. We do, about 25% of the time. Really, mm -hmm. really. Do you get any feedback about their experience down the road from there, how they're affected by not having a celebration? Not through our industry. That's, that's a tracking device we haven't figured out yet. We would mm -hmm. certainly love to, to hear how they're feeling about that a year down the road or more. But as of yet, we haven't been able to know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for people who might be, you know, beginning to think about, well, okay, I should get my plans together? Sure. Uh, well, as I've heard you say several times in, in the time I've known you, you know, talk about it ahead of time. Don't wait until something happens. Think ahead. You know, have that conversation. Uh, don't be afraid to talk to your kids about it. Don't it be won't kill you. That's exactly right. <laughs> and uh, I think those conversations are just so important ahead of time. Yeah. And do you think kids, the children, are more uncomfortable than older parents in starting that conversation? I or? don't. I think it's just the opposite. Really? We're protective of our children. When I teach at a local um, community college here in Albuquerque, the 18 to 25-year-olds are are just hungry for information and have tons of questions and curiosities and and I think it's because we've stopped talking about this subject as a, as a society and and they're very curious about it mm -hmm. and that's what we're all about here at a good goodbye to get that conversation started so um, any last thoughts before um, we uh, switch over to talking about celebrants uh, plan ahead think ahead have the conversation ahead and then be considerate of the other people in your family and what their needs might be, not just your own. Okay. Well, we're going to take a short break, 
And when we return, we'll speak with celebrant Samara Riven and discuss the role celebrants can play in creating a good goodbye. Paul, thanks for coming. Thanks, Gail. How can you eat like that? Relax, dude. I'm freaking dead. It's one of the perks. I can eat whatever the hell I want. How do I get in on this? What, the whole death thing? Yeah. First off, I mean, look at what you're eating. No wonder you've lived this long. Feed this to the village cow, all right? Bring him a glass of your finest expired milk. Oh, before you go checking out, do you have a will? Any funeral arrangements, plans like that? Did you? No, and because of that, now my family's in turmoil. They're fighting, bickering over money. Now they're dead broke. Do some real planning, okay? Before you figure out your exit strategy. See, everybody's doing it. I can't wait to get started. I've never seen anybody dying to die like you. Good luck, kid. Welcome back. I'm pleased to introduce celebrant Samara Rivet to talk about celebrants and how to personalize memorial services. So, uh, Samara, the celebrant movement actually started in Australia, where you're from. Yes, that's right. I'm a celebrant in the USA and Australia. And um, it started, actually sprung out of the um, civil marriage celebrant uh, movement, which was founded in 1973 by um, Justice L um, Lionel Murphy um, as a call for people who were not religiously affiliated who, or secular, who were secular people um, who um, really needed to have a dignified ceremony, but there was no one to provide that. It was mainly done through churches or mm -hmm. religious institutions or a very dry, perfunctory service or mm -hmm. statement um, through a marriage registry. Mm -hmm. And then um, probably a few years later, some of those people who'd been married by celebrants actually um, um, approached and invited those married celebrants to consider doing secularly based um, funeral ceremonies. And um, there was a little bit of a struggle with it because there was a lot of taboo uh -huh. about um, death and dying um, at that time. But it was around the time Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came to Australia. She did a lot of seminars, education, um, and the, already the um, celebrant movement had been trying to put um, a funeral celebrancy on the map. Mm -hmm. So what makes a celebrant service different from a religious service? Well, firstly, um, it, um, celebrant uh, ceremonies were um, designed originally for people who were not necessarily religiously affiliated, but who needed to have a dignified, um, personalised um, funeral or memorial ceremony. And so those ceremonies, um, the way that we um, create them is to um, uh, work with the families, and um, by family I mean um, close people to the deceased person, uh, including biolog bi biological families. And, um, and we actually have a very in-depth interview process in the very unhurried, in the, in the um, comfort of those people's own homes. We like to have as many of the family members present. Mm -hmm. There's one person who's a designated person. So when, when um, we interview the, the family, we try to include everybody, um, their stories and so forth, and all the symbols and um, poems and music that are meaningful to them or their, their loved one. Or and sayings that they're known for. Yes, and, yes, yeah. or even things like um, if they were an avid fisher, uh -huh. fisherman, yeah. then they might include um, fishing poles and the themes. Yeah. That's right. Finding a theme for the person's life. That's right. And, yeah. and those ceremonies can be traditional or non-traditional. There can be, it doesn't have to be non-religious. There are people who identify as um, none, having none, no religion, nuns, oh. um, um, religiously unaffiliated, who may have spiritual um, beliefs. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are people who are more values-based, um, like uh, rationalists or humanist people. Mm -hmm. So that's not to say one couldn't work in prayers or psalms or other, you know, well, that's right. religiously and related things, but it's not particularly a religious service. No, well, yeah. it can be a religious service. I mean, mm -hmm. there may be people who may not have their 
um, a spiritual leader available. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be religious if, if they wish that. Mm -hmm. The celebrant's um, own um, views and beliefs are really immaterial to the process and that's very important. Mm -hmm. They're trained uh, with very um, professional training to know all about the structure of of how to create a ceremony, mm -hmm. how to write it, how to choreograph, how to speak publicly, and how to rehearse um, all the people speaking. Mm -hmm. um, the in-depth interview is actually a very therapeutic experience, even though we're not therapists, mm -hmm. um, but it's a, a perfect opportunity to get people starting with a healthy expression of feelings and, exactly. and grieving. And we actually then write the ceremony and then it becomes a collaborative process. And the, the people whose ceremony it is for, um, they are the ones that have um, the final say. They have complete control at, over, what, over the content and about everything that happens in the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And you brought some I examples did. of... Uh, I did. This is um, an example of a group. memorial ceremony that was conducted mm -hmm. for a gentleman. Mm -hmm. And um, to just give you an example of how personalized they are. Um, this one here is for a woman who adored flowers. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, um, anything bright and beautiful um, mm -hmm. was something that would have appealed to her. And we also give our clients um, and client families a, um, a folder of um, information and ideas and tips. Um, although the in-depth interview is actually we try to get as, do as much as possible in that. It's about a two or three hour process. Well, and then you have to go write the service Absolutely. and pull together Absolutely. any elements. You know, I, uh, as a celebrant myself, I, um, yeah, would spend probably up to 10 hours between interviewing the family, writing the uh, program, producing it, getting the elements together, and then actually doing it. And then they usually invite you for the party afterwards. That's too. right. That's right. <laughs> well, well, quite often um, uh, celebrants don't go to the celebration afterwards. It's really um, a personal call. Yeah. Um, uh, we conduct the ceremony too, so we have to actually be there and to work very closely and with all the other funeral procession pr pr professionals and also any, any other people who might be there, the musicians and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then um, we, um, so the keepsake ceremony is something I think people like to have. They mm -hmm. really do, do treasure. It's, um, and videotaping actually of ceremonies is something that's also a possibility that I don't think a lot of people think about. That's right. Um, I do know of some um, celebrants who, um, who do actually incorporate those and they are asked to put a, a video tribute together or even a PowerPoint mm -hmm. tribute uh, for the families. And um, sometimes they um, are involved in helping people put the ceremony online. They may be um, instrumental in organising for the ceremony to be um, videoed. Mm -hmm. and um, for people who couldn't get to the ceremony and then they can put that online so that the, the memorial can be viewed online as well. Which is really nice. If people wanted to find a celebrant here in the United States, do you, do you have any um, resources online uh, way people can find? Uh, yes, um, well um, the uh, Celebrant um, Foundation and Institute is based out of New Jersey but it's a national um, uh, organization they actually, um, if a person wants to find a celebrant, they can um, go to their website and they have a full directory of um, certified celebrants. Um, and also, if they want to look into being trained, it's a seven-month process, um, mm -hmm. uh, approximately a seven-month process to be trained as a, as a um, funeral celebrant. And, um, and they can similarly go to that website uh, to make inquiries about it. Well, and I was trained with the Insight Institute. And uh, so the insta insightinstitute.com also has a state-by-state -state directory of people who were certified through them. That's right. And, and also the International College of Celebrancy, which is the founding um, school um, based in Australia, they, uh, they do do distance education um, training as well, which is recognized in the USA mm -hmm. by the um, Celebrant mm -hmm. Institute. What's uh, one of your most memorable ceremonies that uh, you've been involved in? Well, um, I, I, I think that one of the more unusual ones was somebody, it was after the death of the person. So that's something we also do. We don't just do traditional memorials and funeral services. We do a lot of after-death services and 
the one that, I, that, that comes to mind is for a person who was, had lost a very dear friend under ra rather tragic circumstances, and he wanted to have a grief healing ceremony. Oh. So that's one that comes to mind, and, oh. and I did do that with him. And he wanted to do a prayer vigil because he, he was spiritually inclined. So I did a, a prayer vigil for the soul of his friend. Mm -hmm. um, another one was a woman who um, had never been, had never attended her mother's funeral, and had felt that something was really missing. Mm. Um, so she um, asked me to help her put together a ceremony. She also had a very difficult relationship with her mother, uh -huh. so this was a healing journey for herself. And um, she finally decided to have the ceremony only with herself her, and her therapist and myself. Um, originally, she wanted to have all family members, so this was a very, um, very important process for her to, mm -hmm. to go through. Well, you know, I got to do a memorial service for my next door neighbor, who was a lady in her 90s when she died. And about six months before she died, she invited me over to meet with her and her son to plan out what she wanted. And that was such a great gift because we got readings, uh, music. She wanted her nephew to play bagpipes outside and you know play Amazing Grace to lead people out of the uh, out of the chapel where we had it. And we had readings from the New Testament, even though she wasn't particularly religious. But she was always known for having cocktails at five o'clock. Mm -hmm. So we had the service at about four thirty, and we finished up at about five fifteen. And I produced a uh, memorial item of cocktail napkin with her name and date of birth, date of death on it. And people have been coming up to me and saying, that was so wonderful. You know, that was the best funeral I've ever been to. So bringing those kind of creative touches to it can really uh, make it a very healing mm. service, as you say. And, and you know, you touched upon this um, point of um, pre-need. Um, funeral ceremonies, that's something we really encourage, that people can actually ha arrange to have their funeral ceremony written mm -hmm. um, before they die, and um, they can bring family members into the process. And also one other area which is not as well known as, we've talked to, um, you've talked about um, green funerals. Mm -hmm. um, um, having a green funeral ceremony is also an option, and there are many ways to do that. Of course, it's all are very client focused and client centered. It's it's not my need. It's not mm -hmm. what I think needs to happen. Mm -hmm. It's how they define that yeah, that we can um, service. And you can also have a living memorial service. The That's person, right. especially a person who might have cancer and knows they're yep. going to die, uh, it can be a very special celebration to bring people together. So that person can say what needs to be said. You know, whether it's expressions of love or forgiveness and receive those messages as well. They can be extraordinarily healing, um, those, um, those kinds of ceremonies. And, um, and um, we do celebrations of life. Um, so people may say, oh, I don't want to do, uh, have a funeral. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we might have a celebration of life. And of course, m most of our ceremonies, people will want to tell the story of the person. Mm -hmm. What moved them? What, what, what uh, made them tick? What was their past like? What are their values? What, what are their legacies? So that's extremely treasured to a lot of the people who are in the, in the congregation. Um, they don't even know half of the person's story quite often. Right. So it's well, and very often it's the bringing together of different circles of that person's life. And, and that's when you do discover these stories like, oh, I didn't know that about this person. And that can become very helpful because it engages them. They, they may sh wish to share a bit about that new discovery, and mm -hmm. that can help mm -hmm. in the healing that's, process. And that's when you get together at the party afterwards for eating and drinking and talking some more. That's right. <laughs> uh, any last tips uh, on helping people be prepared? I think um, it, uh, people can always call any celebrant, and we actually have an, um, an, um, a no obligation um, consultation can call to discuss. So if you can't see a celebrant in person, it can be done over the phone. And I, I suggest, you know, start thinking about the things that are important to you and start writing down some ideas about some um, things that mean something to you, poems and songs and things you want people to remember you by. 
Oh, great advice. Thank you so much, Samara. Oh, thank you. And thanks to uh, Paul Lair with French Funerals and Cremations, who uh, are our sponsors for today's show. Big thanks to the French family of companies and all of their support. Join us next week as we look at some other issues that you can find out more about on our website, agoodgoodbye.com. So remember, talking about sex won't make you pregnant. Talking about funerals won't make you dead. Start a conversation today. estate planning enables you to pass your possessions and your assets to the people and organizations that you care about. By planning with a living trust, you could avoid the high cost of probate and minimize taxation. The attorneys at Morris Hall have been helping thousands of clients pass their assets as they intended. To schedule your free consultation, call us at 505-889-0100 or visit us at morristrust.com. A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die is a light touch on a serious subject. The book has everything you need to know before you go. A Good Goodbye helps you reduce stress and family conflict, save money, and create a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. It's available in paperback and all ebook formats through online retailers and at agoodgoodbye.com. Start a conversation today. Why are we talking about this at the dinner table? Just put my ashes in a coffee can or something. Please pass the salt, dear. Can I help you, ma'am? Yeah. Which can would you recommend putting my mom's ashes in? Uh, I think I heard ashes. I'm sorry, my mom's cremated remains. <laughs> that sounds the same. Your mom didn't even like coffee. She drank tea. You can't avoid your funeral. Pre-plan and take the burden off someone else. Hi, I'm Gail Rubin, host and author of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die, and creator of The Newly Dead Game. The Newly Dead Game is like the classic TV show The Newly Wed Game, but the questions test how well you know someone else's last wishes. It's a fun way to get the funeral planning conversation started. For more information about The Newly Dead Game, visit agoodgoodbye.com.